Hey everyone, this is Mike from Comic Book Trove, here today with another Omnibus review. And today I'm going to take a look at the recently reprinted X-Men Omnibus Volume 2. Now, this is one that's really exciting to have for myself as, a, as an X-Men fan and an X-Men Omnibus collector more specifically, because uh, as was the case with uh, Volume 1, which was also reprinted not too long ago now, uh, both these volumes had been really hard to find. They were out of print for many years, and just very difficult to track down. So it was really great news, not only when Marvel announced they were getting reprinted, but that we've had them both reprinted really so close together as well. Been a really good couple of months in that regard, as well as, you know, a few other long awaited reprints that we've had in recent times. Um, but let's take a look at this, as I've already covered volume one on the channel. We'll look at this second volume today, dive into it and take a look at that. The dust cover here then, this is the DM variant cover, this is the, the original classic cover to issue 39 by George Tusker. And what's cool about this cover and this issue generally is it was the first issue in the series where the X-Men team members were able to be given their own individual costumes. So we see them all here appearing in those costumes. Prior to this they had all worn the same uh, yellow and black uniform. In this issue, for the first time, they got to express some individuality and have different costumes to each other. And of course, that would be the case with the X-Men really ever since. They've never shared a costume other than for one-off kind of short periods for a specific story here or there. But in general, all the team members pretty much have always had their own individual costumes ever since this point. Taking a look at the spine, we've got the X-Men written there in that uh, small font. And the creator names down here in smaller font, we've got the writers Roy Thomas and Arnold Drake, and the artists here, Neil Adams, of course, Don Heck and Werner Roth, being the main ones that we see the work of in here. Although there are a couple of other ones who also do an issue or two, and we'll have a look at that as we go through here. On the back, we've got the cover gallery then, so you're pretty much standard fare for your Silver Age, Bronze Age material era omnibuses. And at the bottom we get the material. So the remaining X-Men issues of this original run, 32 to 66, crossover with Avengers, a couple of Kazar issues, and uh, Marvel Tales 30, or at least some material from those. Um, oh, just one other thing, I'll just quickly do a comparison here with the first spine of the first volume for anybody who's wondering what they would look like together. It's just the spine, not the book, uh, the dust cover I mean, not the book. Um, but yeah, so they'll look like that with those images at the bottom. That's for the DM variant of the first volume as well. So that's the two DMs together, what they look like. On the book itself, same design as the first volume with this new printing. So we've got the X-Men here in this yellow and blue. There is a different image on the spine of mine here because I think this is the cover you, not the cover, the image you'd get with the standard cover. Slightly different one. And then this X logo on the back. This is a slightly thicker volume than uh, volume one. It's about 100 pages more, I think, in here. Um, opening page here, this is really cool. This is uh, Jim Steranko image. And Steranko is really the other key penciler who's not included amongst the names on the spine. This is another Steranko image. That, of course, being uh, Polaris, Laura Dane. As we move into the creator names here, so quite a lot of different creators working on this uh, this, this part of the run, and in the introductions that are included in here, written by Roy Thomas, which were originally provided for the uh, Marvel Masterworks collecting this material, he does in fact joke about how it was a bit of, uh, sort of musical chairs with the creative staff having to work on this book. Felt like frequently changing artists in particular. Uh, but we get a number of issues by Werner Roth, uh, Don Heck and Neil Adams, but also uh, Dan Adkins, Ross Andrew, George Tusker, Steranko, Barry Windsor Smith, who was just known as Barry Smith at this point, Sal Buscema, and John Buscema because of the Avengers issue, which was drawn by him. Um, but yeah, a few different creators all in all. You can see them all listed here, of course. And then the contents page. There are a few introductions in here, as I mentioned, by Roy Thomas, and the issues are all listed, of course, chronologically with their publication dates. Um, but yeah, so this book is the second half of the Silver Age era of the, of the X-Men. And it collects really a lot of, I suppose, if we're being honest, a mixed bag of material in terms of the quality. So the X-Men was a book that was performing poorly in terms of its sales figures back in the day when these issues were first coming out. And what we see in this, this volume in particular, more so than the first volume, I think, is 
well, what were quite admittedly quite desperate attempts by, you know, Stan Lee as the uh, the editor and Roy Thomas, who was writer and assistant editor working on this series for pretty much all of this stuff in here, to try and reinvigorate interest in the book. So we get a few different things introduced in here, a few different things get shaken up a little bit to try and, I suppose, reinvigorate reader interest in this series as those sales figures were waning. Um, but yeah, so I just think that the X-Men, they struggled a little bit, in all honesty, through these, these early days. They didn't get off to a strong start, which always seems quite ironic when you think about the kind of juggernaut that the franchise ended up becoming, certainly under uh, Chris, uh, Chris Claremont's stewardship in later years after this. Um, but here we see a guest appearance by Spider-Man, for example, as well as another appearance by Banshee, who is still technically, I think, a villain at this point. Usually, back in the day here, whenever Spider-Man guest appeared in the series, it was a pretty clear sign that that series was struggling, because putting Spider-Man in a book was basically a, a desperate way of trying to make people want to buy this issue, because obviously Spider-Man, super popular... The hope was that readers would see him on the cover of another series and think, oh, wow, Spider-Man's in this. Let's read that. Um, also really cool to see the uh, original letters included in here. Maybe I don't always mention that enough, but I love that Marvel do that in these classic Silver Age Marvel omnibuses. So you get that, that appreciation and um, that insight into what readers at the time were thinking about these issues as they were coming out. You get to read the response to them. I think that's really cool. Um, but yeah, so a couple of key things happen through here, so I suppose we'll give a, a quick spoiler warning, just in case, but uh, one of the key things that ends up happening in here is apparently, well, the apparent death of Charles Xavier occurs partway through here, he disappears from the title for a bit, having been seemingly killed, and the intention at the time, according to Roy Thomas, was that he genuinely would stay dead, but they ended up bringing him back, of course. I don't think it's any secret that Charles Xavier obviously didn't really die here. Um, we see a lot of recurring villains who were previously introduced. So the Blob and the Vanisher both appeared, I think, very early on in I think the second and third issues of the series. But as always, you get a lot of villains coming back. The Sentinels also get reused here towards the end of this uh, run, actually. And... They start to feature backup stories as well in some of the issues. So, you know, we see here, for example, the first one they did was uh, the one featuring Charles Xavier. And they started doing Origins of the X-Men. So each backup story told kind of like an early tale featuring one of the members of the team. So Xavier, um, Cyclops, Jean Grey, Beast, Angel, Iceman. They featured them all, I think, over the course of these issues. This is issue 39, so there's a the cover we saw there by George Tusker, of course. This one where the new costumes come in, but that doesn't happen until the very end of the issue. And uh, also, it wasn't Tusker who actually draw this, it was, uh, drew this, I mean, it was Don Heck. Um, Banshee appearing again through here. And... This is the page where they get the costumes. And the way that's explained is that uh, Jean Grey kind of made them. So that's kind of amusing. It sort of reminds me, well, it's very reminiscent, I think, of the Fantastic Four, where they first got their costumes very early on in the, for the fourth issue of Fantastic Four, I think, or the third issue, um, where it was Sue Storm who created all their costumes. I love the idea of it always being the female member of the team that creates the costumes for everybody. Um, what do we see? Oh yeah, Frankenstein. So this is kind of a funny one, bit of an interesting one. This is where those kind of, you can see the kind of more wacky ideas being tried out to try and pretty much do anything to get this book to appeal to more people. Um, they were willing to get quite experimental with it. So Frankenstein appears, the Frankenstein monster. Although later on Marvel would actually do a uh, Frankenstein comic during the 70s when monster comics were going through a resurgence and you had series like Tomb of Dracula and Werewolf by Night. They also did a Frankenstein comic and it was not this Frankenstein. They kind of deliberately overlooked this one and did their own story. Uh, 
There's also this story featuring supposedly the first evil mutant. Another story that I think has been retconned out of continuity. And then the series started to change a little bit where they stopped just calling it X-Men and they actually changed it so that the series title would be more focused on individual members of the team. Again, I think done because, you know, Stan Lee, who was generally in charge of these sorts of uh, creative decisions, just figured let's mix it up a little bit, see if it makes a difference. Um, here's the death of Professor X storyline, where he apparently dies. And here on this final splash page, very uh, dramatic, sad page. Um with then another backup as well. And these, the last few issues here, the backups we've been seeing are all featuring the beginning of Cyclops, as they call it, Cyclops' origin. Um, the way that, anyway, that ended up being explained away was that Professor Xavier had never actually been there. It was, in fact, the mutant, the changeling, who had taken the form of Charles Xavier, and it was, in fact, him who had died. And during this time, Xavier was in hiding planning to come back at the right time, basically. And here we see these new style of uh, logos that they did. So instead of just the X-Men, it was the X-Men featuring the angel, etc. Um, Red Raven, I think this was when they brought back a Golden Age character, if I remember rightly. I think Red Raven was a very obscure Golden Age character that Roy Thomas liked, wanted to bring him back. This is all very interesting to read through, though, so as, as they go through different uh, <laughs> different ideas, different styles of trying to mix this comic up. So here we see the X-Men featuring Cyclops, issue 45 here. Um, this was during a couple of issues where Gary Friedrich was writing it. Pretty sure after this issue, Arnold Drake becomes the main writer. Arnold Drake, who had been the main creator of Doom Patrol, over at DC prior to this. Oh yeah, here's the issue of Avengers. So this is where it crosses over briefly with uh, the Avengers. Uh, it's a, a fight against Magneto that brings the X-Men and Avengers together only for it to, of course, turn into a quick fight between the Avengers and the X-Men. Because especially in these days, if you had two superheroes meet from different series or two teams meet, pretty much guaranteed they were going to get into a misunderstanding and a fight before they eventually realise they're on the same side and turn against the villain. Uh, so here, the <laughs> one of those dramatic kind of covers that declares it's the end of the X-Men with uh, Charles Xavier having been apparently killed. Um, this is still a Gary Friedrich issue, actually. But I think what happens here is I think the team sort of splits up briefly. Pretty sure Cyclops and Jean Grey go one way and the Beast and Iceman, I think, go off on their own as well. So the thing about these stories is, you know, as many people have said and you may well have heard if you've not read this stuff before, is it's not the strongest material. And even as a big X-Men fan, I'll be one of the first people to say that, um, you know, this isn't the best stuff. Uh, but it is great history to have, and there's certainly like some good stuff in here, even if all of it isn't necessarily fantastic. Um, cool artwork here by Don Heck. But what you do get in here that I really do love is the all-too-brief run by Jim Steranko as the artist, who contributes one super significant thing to the series which I'll show off in a moment. Uh, Steranko did do this cover, and it's kind of immediately the first super cool cover, I think, in the series up till this point. I just, honestly, Steranko is one of those artists who I just think his artwork looks incredibly cool and amazing to this day. Super unique style. Uh, just such a fun and amazing style to look at when you're reading an issue illustrated by him. And it's a real shame that he didn't draw more comics. I'll just say that. I mean, his main run is on 
uh, Nick Fury, Agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. And I still need to cover that omnibus so I can talk about his artwork in all, all the more detail I'd like to. Um, but we are about to see the two issues in here drawn by Steranko, including this incredible change that he made to the series. And this is something that I think many people do not know. But Jim Steranko was the guy who redesigned the X-Men logo from being that kind of very generic looking series logo that they had from the very beginning into the much more iconic kind of slanted X-Men logo here. And this has remained the logo ever since, you know, or at least the most commonly used logo for the X-Men in different media ever since this issue here came out. And I think that's a huge contribution to the series that I don't think Steranko gets enough credit for. But even that aside, this is immediately the best artwork that this series has had up to this stage, if you ask me. That's just my opinion, I know. You might not maybe like Steranko's work as much as I do, but I'm a huge fan. I absolutely love his experimental, kind of unique style. I don't think anyone has ever really drawn comics in, in this way before or even since. Even people who've imitated Steranko haven't quite done it as well as he did when he did these these comics back in the day. This um, kind of st uh, logo design, title design, whatever you want to call it, even the way he did stuff like that, the guy was like a natural graphic designer and it really shows in the way that he constructed panels and page work. And this isn't even his best work, I don't think. Pretty sure I would say all of his best work is featured in the Nick Fury stories that he worked on but nevertheless really cool to see a couple of issues all be them very short in here by him but luckily he's not the last truly amazing artist that we see working on the x-men here as very soon after this we see of course neil adams come onto the series and neil adams really never did a whole lot of marvel work you know across his career but the longest run that he did do on any one series were the issues of the X-Men that he worked on. So here we see uh, Blastar, a familiar figure to me as a, as a Fantastic Four reader. You may well recognise him from there. From the, uh, I think it's from the Negative Zone. Causes these huge blasts, hence the name Blastar, obviously. A lengthy essay introduction there by Roy Thomas. The guy likes to write, but he certainly knows his stuff. I think when you come across a Roy Thomas introduction slash essay in a book like this, it's usually, well, in fact, it's always well worth reading, in my experience, because the guy's like an incredibly enthusiastic comic book historian, just as much as he's been a comic book writer in his career. He knows his stuff and he loves comic books and you'll almost definitely learn something if you read some of that stuff that he writes about anything like this. So we are almost to the point now, pretty sure it's issue 56, where Neil Adams comes on board. Funny thing about how Neil Adams got this book was that he had met with Stan Lee, talked about the idea of coming to Marvel to do some work, and he had specifically asked Stan if he were to do so to let him come and work on the poorest selling series that Marvel had. And that happened to be uh, the X-Men. So he ends up getting this book. And this cover here, I think, is a really iconic one. One that's been homaged, I think, a few times. But certainly the one big homage that I'm aware of is John Byrne's Dark Phoenix cover that he would ultimately do. And uh, you know, John Byrne always cited Neil Adams as a huge influence on him. And this is the first issue Adam's illustrated. And I think as you go through these next few issues and see his work, it's clear to see why he's been a big influence on artists like John Byrne in the years that followed, because he was a really great artist who put a lot of style into these books. It's a shame, really, that it ended up being too little too late to save this book. Because, of course... It did end up being cancelled as of issue 66. 
leading to that then five year time gap between 1970 and 75 where we had no new X-Men comics published and the characters were to show up now and then as guest stars in other series but uh, the X-Men as a book yeah was gone for five years until it finally was revitalized and revived of course with uh, the uh, iconic giant size X-Men 1 and then Chris Claremont's run beginning with issue 94. The rest obviously was history. Um, but yeah, even though this was the uh, the twilight really of this first era for the book, it was nevertheless a highlight really for the series, you could say. It's a bit of a paradox really, that we're seeing the, uh, the very end of the book in this original incarnation and yet also seeing arguably some of the best artwork that there's ever featured on, on X-Men. Really, really like some of these uh, pages. You see Sauron here. That's the pterodactyl Sauron, not the guy who wants his magic ring back. Um, but yeah, really like this artwork. I really, really got to say. I think definitely the highlight. But let me know as well, you know, what, uh, what you think of this era of X-Men in general, this whole 60s era. And whether or not you'd be picking this book up. Because always happy to hear the thoughts. Hopefully, flicking through this book now has been interesting enough to give you a good bit of insight into what it's like. As we come towards the end. Um... I think the final issue of the book, though, unfortunately, was not drawn by Neil Adams. Uh, this was the final issue, actually. In fact, that's the final page of the final issue. I think this was Sal Buscema artwork on here. Um, but I like the ending here. It just kind of goes, and they fought happily ever after? Question mark. And that's it. That's the end of the X-Men. So that was the final ending point for the X-Men series. And we wouldn't see them again properly till 1975. The last few issues in here... Um, are the material from, so this is a couple of sections where the material from issues of Kazar, or Kazar. I can never decide how, how to actually say that correctly. I've heard it pronounced both ways. Um, but yeah, so it's a couple of stories here, mainly featuring the angel, I think. And then there's these not Brandeck things, and I never like not Brandeck. Just doesn't do it for me. This kind of satirical, comedic, light-hearted things. Meh. Not my thing. But I uh, suppose it's cool that they're in there. Um, anyway, so we've got some cool extras in the back of this book, though. So a lot of unused original artwork. This was a cover that Gil Kane did to issue 33 that the Comics Code were sort of outraged by for some reason. They thought that this creature looked too scary and gruesome, so they forced them to change it. And they had to redraw it as a juggernaut cover. Crazy to think how sensitive comic book cens censorship was back then with the comics code. Um, but yeah, a lot of cool original artwork in here. Some Neil Adams stuff here. Some of these pages are sticking together for me. Yeah. Always a slightly tense moment when you got a book like this and the pages are sticking. Uh, it's happening again. Fun. Um... Oh, that's cool. Tom McFarlane outlook. Eek, that sound. Hate it. Um, but this is all pretty cool stuff. You know, a lot of artwork. Yeah. Yikes. Um, oh, yeah. Havoc. Kind of forgot to mention that Havoc does first appear in here in issue 54, along with uh, Polaris as well in issue 49 or 50, I think. Couple of key characters there making first appearances. Um, but yeah, there we go then. So that's the second X-Men omnibus collecting the remainder of the Silver Age era of the X-Men. So between the X-Men volume one and two, you get the full 60s Silver Age collection of this classic franchise. And great to have this kind of history, as I say. It's wonderful to see it restored like this and, and to have it in a book that's as convenient to read as these omnibuses are. So 
let me know, as I say, uh, how you feel about these, uh, these books and this era of X-Men. Hope you found this video to be enjoyable slash interesting in some way. Thank you very much for watching and I'll be back again soon to discuss something else.